Hello, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of Baker, Hostetler, and Deloitte, we would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Assessing Your Compliance Program with Data and Analytics. How can you meet the DOJ's expectation of using operational data and analytics in your compliance programs? This presentation will last 90 minutes. This webinar is available for CLE credit in California, Colorado, Georgia, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Washington, and is pending for CLE approval in Florida, Illinois, Kansas, and Virginia. For all other states, credit will be applied for as requested. Please be advised that there will be two points during the program where we will pause for CLE codes. During this time, a code will appear in the slide deck you see on your screen. Please make sure to write down this code if you are seeking CLE credit as you'll be asked for it at the conclusion of the presentation. A CLE and program evaluation will be available immediately following the conclusion of the webinar at 1230 Eastern, where we will ask for your bar number and the two CLE codes. If you have questions, you can submit via the Q&A box in the Zoom platform. We will do our best to address them throughout the program. Now I'd like to turn it over to today's moderator, Baker Hostetler partner, Jimmy Focus. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today from uh, hopefully far and wide. I know most of us are still in our home offices. So thanks for inviting us into your homes today or wherever you might be residing. I think we have a uh, great set of panelists today on a really interesting cutting edge topic. Um, and like Kristen said at the onset, you know, feel free to ask questions. We will hopefully have enough time at the end for to answer some of your questions. But uh, you know, obviously, there's been some some recent guidance out there, and so we want to uh, you know discuss what it means and how how to incorporate data analytics into an effective compliance program and what the government is going to expect, what it does expect, and, and then how to bake that into to your compliance program. So with that, I'll just briefly introduce uh, the panel, starting with myself. I'm Jimmy Focus. I'm a partner at Baker Hostetler in New York in the white collar and securities litigation practice. Uh, prior to my tenure at Baker, I was a senior counsel in the New York office of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, where I had the opportunity to investigate and litigate securities fraud cases. Uh, next panelist is Pat Campbell. Pat is also a member, uh, partner at Baker Hostetler and a member of Baker's white collar and securities enforcement litigation team. Uh, his practice focuses on civil regulatory matters, white collar criminal matters, internal investigations, uh, specifically in the areas of securities, construction, FCPA, and so on. Uh, next panelist is Jonathan New. Jonathan New started his career as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York. And prior to that, he served as a trial attorney for the Department of Justice's Civil Division. Today, John uh, represents public and private companies, corporate executives and individuals in all sorts of complex civil, regulatory and criminal law enforcement matters. Um, our colleagues from Deloitte, we'll start with Shuba Balasubramanian. Uh, Shuba is a principal in the risk and financial advisory practice of Deloitte's transactions and business analytics uh, team. And she has 18 years of experience in leveraging advanced analytics to deliver insights to her clients through innovative solutions that help them address pressing issues on things like enterprise risk management. And that's where I think you're gonna hear some very interesting things today about how to use that data or where to find that data. And Shuba will help explain that. Uh, next is Chris Giorgio. Chris is a partner and a member of Deloitte's Forensics and Dispute Services uh, practice team in, in, De in the Deloitte Financial Advisory Services. Uh, so in addition to being a foremost expert on the FCPA and having conducted FCPA investigations far and wide across the world, uh, in his prior life, Chris was also an auditor and an audit partner at Deloitte, uh, auditing public companies, and so brings that experience to, to our panel today as well. Um, and last, but certainly not least, our friend Brian Merrill. Brian is a managing director also in Deloitte's financial and advisory services practice and business. And, you know, what Brian does is he's got more than 15 years of experience in data management and advanced analytics and has used that, you know, in lead client engagements where they've analyzed hundreds of millions of records to identify and extract key business insights in order to understand things like trends, issues, and particularly of note for today's presentation is anomalies and, and maybe compliance problems. So 
with that, um, just turn to the, turning to the agenda slide, uh, today, this is what we plan to cover, is how data and analytics, one, factors into the DOJ guidance um, that was that was updated last June. And, you know, since that time, um, we'll also talk about some recent developments and how the DOJ has essentially started adopting and putting that guidance into criminal resolutions with entities. Um, we're also going to spend a lot of time about discussing how to harness and use data and you know where to look within your program, within your existing line of business uh, for data and how to make use of that. You know, again, we are, you know, the government expects a lot. We're supposed to be gatekeepers. We have, you know, we're lawyers, we're accountants. Um, now, you know, we're asked some questions. Are we supposed to also be data scientists? Um, and you know, how do we how do we go about uh, doing that, both in organizations large and small? And lastly, we'll discuss how to use and incorporate data in internal investigations. And again, what we think the government's expectations are, whether it's a criminal prosecutor or a uh, some other regulator, federal or state regulator, that's going to be analyzing and assessing your compliance program. So with that, oh, let's give our CLE code. Please record the code data one for the post program evaluation. Please make sure to write down this code if you're requesting CLE credit as you'll be asked for it at the conclusion of this program. Data one. So Pat, why don't you kick us off here today and uh, let's start with the basics. So, you know, there's been the DOJ, the criminal division issued guidance on effective corporate compliance programs back in 2012, I guess. Walk us through that and, and you know, kind of, you know, tell us wh why, why do we, we care about this and why do we care about any of the updates? Sure. Thanks, Jimmy. And uh, thank you to all the attendees for spending some time with us today. So the DOJ's criminal division has a structure in place for uh, strongly incentivizing companies to have adequate and effective compliance programs. And it formulated its 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program in 2012, as you see on the graph on the slide, and follow through with some updates. And today we're going to be spending time talking on about its last update uh, in, uh, in June 2020. And essentially, um, these guidelines are a series of questions that the DOJ asks uh, to uh, determine um, whether the company is maintaining a risk-based adequate and effective compliance program. And importantly, it uses this information uh, to uh, determine whether to bring charges uh, against the corporate uh, a company for alleged misconduct. And if it does bring charges, what types of sanctions to seek? So it's incredibly important. And, uh, you know, it's something that uh, uh, the companies, you know, uh, should definitely take into account when, when building their compliance programs. So you have the hallmarks that the DOJ started with in 2012. Uh, there were 10 of them. Uh, they've been expanded a little bit. And uh, one of my colleagues from Deloitte uh, will talk about what the hallmarks are uh, in a minute, so I'm not gonna go into them. But from that document, the DOJ then evolved into creating these evaluation of corporate compliance uh, program documents. Uh, the 10 hallmarks um, are you know, consistently uh, themed throughout these documents. Uh, but what these other documents do, the one 2017, 2019, and 2020, the most recent one that we're gonna discuss today, uh, just uh, builds context and questions around each of these hallmarks, again, uh, for, the, the, for the DOG's purpose to consider whether the company is hitting the marks uh, that, um, you know, pertain to the DOJ's guidance that it puts out and whether it's maintaining uh, an adequate and effective compliance program. Now, it actually started before 2012. Uh, the, the U.S. sentencing guidelines also has a, um, as a mitigating factor whether a, a company has an adequate and effective compliance program. And uh, so, you know, and, and uh, the, a lot of the hallmarks that, uh, that you see uh, that the DOJ issued in 2012, and then in 2017 onward, actually came uh, from the US sentencing guidelines, um, you know, mitigating factor, uh, I think back in 2005, uh, when that was issued. Now, uh, you know, just I'll note, that uh, these are the DOJ criminal division guidelines. And also on the slide, you see the core questions that, uh, that DOJ, um, that, that are embodied in the DOJ's evaluation of corporate compliance guidelines. Uh, we'll be talking about certain components of, of these questions uh, throughout the presentation, but the guidelines are essentially built around those questions. Those are like the, the topic questions, and then the guidelines have separate sub-questions within those questions. 
And, uh, you know, the, the DOJ's antitrust division also has uh, similar um, corporate compliance guidelines. Other regulators have guidelines. So, you know, OFAC has a framework for compliance commitments uh, with respect to whether a company has an adequate and effective sanctions compliance program. It's built around mo many of the same hallmarks uh, as you have in the DOJ's guidelines. And the SEC and the DOJ have guidelines regarding an anti-corruption compliance program. Uh, and you could find that in the uh, DOJ and SEC's F FCPA resource guide, which was uh, just uh, recently updated. I think it was issued back in 2012 and recently uh, updated uh, in, uh, in, in uh, 2020, uh, uh, late last year, I think. In, uh, so, uh, so this is uh, not unique to the DOJ, though uh, you know, the DOJ's criminal division guidelines are obviously very important uh, for companies uh, to consider uh, when building out uh, their, their compliance programs. You can go to the next slide. And so, Chris, I guess you know, the DOJ's updated it last year with, with you know, that, the use of data and, and evaluating the use of data in order to determine uh, one portion of determining the effectiveness of a compliance program, I guess. Has that changed in any way the hallmarks of what goes into uh, or what should go into an, an organization's effective compliance program? Thank, thanks, Jimmy, and, and uh, good morning to everybody on the phone. Uh, so the answer to your question is actually no, right? The, the, the hallmarks of an effective compliance program have not really changed. But what has changed are the regulator's expectations. They expect more. They believe the program should be dynamic and should evolve as new information becomes available, not only during an annual or periodic assessment. They, they recognize that those periodic processes like risk assessments are, are a critical component in the compliance program. And we'll discuss that more a little later. Uh, but they do want compliance organizations to react as the business or risks change. You know, consider the impact of an acquisition or findings from an investigation, or maybe new regulations in certain markets. The compliance team should have the insight to these changes in real time and be able to determine how does that impact the risk today um, and make changes in the program as necessary, not next year, but now. Uh, what, what information do you need today to determine the risks identified, whether it's isolated to one location, one business unit, or is it potentially a regional risk? Once identified, how will you modify controls and how will you, you monitor these risks going forward? As said, you know, the context for our comments today is a company is asserting it has an effective compliance program and is providing support of that assertion to the regulators. The regulator's presumption is that the hallmarks of an effective compliance program listed on the slide are present. They expect the program will have been appropriately tailored by the organization to address its specific corruption risks. What the guidance emphasizes is that organizations must be able to demonstrate to regulators how effective its program is in identifying corrupt activity. And if such activity does occur and, and it will occur, how the different elements are adapted to address the new risks identified in the operations. The guidance also emphasizes how data can improve the effectiveness of compliance in most areas listed on the slide. The expectation is that the compliance team will, will, be, be, uh, excuse me, will be able to better leverage available data and presumes that there are no restric restrictions on accessing that data in order to conduct the periodic testing and reviews necessary to test the effectiveness of the program. We will shortly discuss in more detail how organizations are leveraging their data and supporting their compliance programs. And my colleagues will address the various tools and techniques that can be utilized by compliance teams. But bef before we dive in, give some thought to opportunities to better leverage data sources that you may not have historically used to test effectiveness. Tools such as employee surveys related to understanding of confidential reporting mechanisms or compliance policies or maybe analyses that you can do with respect to whistleblower or hotline complaint activity when you compare it with other organizational data like HR data around management changes. These are the, the opportunities to enhance your, your compliance program and its effectiveness and to test its effectiveness. In the past, our experience, um, the data available to compliance professionals has generally been limited and sometimes at a point in time. 
and organizations have not been willing to invest in technology solutions solely to support compliance activities. But there's a real opportunity right now as organizations transform. The pandemic has forced companies to reimagine their systems, processes, and activities, in short, to digitize the business. If compliance has a seat at the table, you will have the opportunity to identify the key sources of information you need to test the effectiveness of controls in the context of the broader business transformation. With that, Jimmy, we'll pass it on to the, to the next slide. Yeah, so, so some some excellent points, Chris. And I guess, John, so what is what is the government really looking for here as it pertains to data and, and, and an effective compliance program? I guess how, you know, this this guidance is is we're coming up on a year. What are, what are they what are they what's the messaging been from the DOJ in terms of how this fits in on a going forward basis since now prosecutors at least prosecutors in the criminal division are being directed to to take a look at this and it's and as we'll see it, it's become a part of of corporate resolutions over the past year yeah thanks jimmy that's a, that's a great question and good morning everybody it's a pleasure to be talking to you today um so you know i, I think the the answer to that jimmy is picking up on a lot of what pat and chris actually just emphasized and i think just to sort of synthesize you know, the two sides of it there a little bit um, you know, as Pat mentioned, DOJ's guidance on corporate compliance programs, as well as the other regulatory agencies' guidance, has evolved over time based upon their real-world experience. And so there's almost been like a feedback loop, right, between, you know, DOJ and companies and their compliance professionals and, you know, forensic experts like Chris and our friends at Deloitte in terms of what works, what doesn't work, um, what should be fixed. And so they've incorporated that as their guidelines have evolved over time. At the same time, and this is where data comes in, you know, DOJ, the SEC, other regulators, the CFTC themselves have learned to use data as part of their investigations. Um, and this is something that they've mentioned frequently over the past several years, um, that they have been using data uh, and data analysis um, in order to not only identify potential criminal or illegal activity, but also then to investigate it. Um, and so given that they've gotten that experience, they expect you know, corporations out there to be doing similar types of things to be proactive. Um, and this is, you know, in keeping with, you know, the messaging that DOJ has sent uh, and the SEC over the past several years where they, they want to try to convey to corporations that they view as you as a partner uh, in terms of trying to um, prevent, uh, you know, mis misconduct from happening in the first instance uh, and then discovering it and rooting out um, in the second instance, that you you know you are on the front lines of this, and it's not only because they want you to do it, but because it's also in your best interest as a company um, to be able to, to to do this. And so, um, what they have have done is they've tried to incorporate into the hallmarks of an effective compliance program um, that that Chris just mentioned different aspects where data analysis might fit in logically. So, uh, in the most recent guidelines, for example. Um, you know, this is the first time where they've explicitly, this is the update from June of 2020, explicitly included areas where they're going to question companies about how they're using data. Um, so if you run through the first, you know, the three different, you know, broad topic questions, as Pat mentioned, you know, the first one is, um, is the program well designed? That's the first thing that DOJ is going to look at. Um, and as Chris mentioned, um, that analysis focuses to a large extent on um, risk assessment, right? Like, you know, do you, are you incorporating data, as, as I think we're gonna go into a little more depth later on, uh, are you incorporating data into your risk assessment programs? And are you constantly evaluating that and updating it? And, and, and based on the new inputs that you're getting, changing your risk assessment. So that's, that's the first part of it. The second question uh, that DOJ asks in their guidelines is, um, how is the corporate compliance program actually being applied? Is it a paper program or is it a real life, you know, attempt to try to prevent and screen out wrongdoing? And in doing that, um, the access to data, as Chris mentioned, is incredibly important to them. They want to see that um, your, your compliance officers and, and your compliance professionals have access to the same data that the business side does and that they do it uh, almost in real time, uh, in a regular fashion. Um, and that is something that they look at in terms of determining 
not only whether or not the compliance function is adequately resourced, but also whether it's empowered to function effectively. Because it's, it's one thing to get all the data. It's another thing to have a compliance program where once they get the data and they analyze it, they can do something with it and the company supports them. So that's, that's an important factor for DOJ. Um, and then finally, um, there's the question of how does the program work in practice? Um, and there, um, they're also looking at the effectiveness of the program um, how you're evaluating yourself, the effectiveness of the program. Are you doing testing? Are you doing monitoring? And how does data play into that? Um, and so, you know, in all three aspects of these questions, they're now integrating data more and more. And I think we can expect over time that they're going to be, you know, seeing different ways that data plays in as they start interacting um, with compliance programs that now have integrated data in this way. It's it's constantly evolving what DOJ wants and what they're trying to do is evolve in line with the industry so that they are representing best practices. Um, but it's always good to try to stay ahead of the curve. And hopefully, um, you know, as, as, as Brian and Shuba are about to, to, to speak to you guys, you can, you can stay ahead of the curve and make DOJ very happy. And thanks, Jonathan. Just a quick point on, on something you mentioned I think is relevant for the group. Uh, especially around how the regulators are leveraging data to, to assess compliance from the outside in. Uh, and for those um, attendees who are you know, within the financial services um, industry, you're probably familiar with the SEC's enforcement around uh, share class selection. And you know, there was a lot of activity there where the SEC um, you know, requested self-disclosure around improper activities for share class selections. And they, they had known effectively you know, which organizations were potentially uh, having issues in that matter. Um, but they're, they're watching and looking at those types of issues, you know, leveraging data, uh, collecting information and, and supporting that kind of regulatory reporting area to better enforce and ensure compliance. So it's important for, for all of us uh, as compliance professionals and you know, analytics professionals uh, to consider you know, how we can you know, mitigate those types of risks and you know, better assure the business. Uh, so Jimmy, what... yeah, we'll go next slide. And so, but just on that on that point, Brian, I guess. So, what are we? Are we, you know, we're supposed to be data scientists now? I mean, how, how, how can a company incorporate the use of data in their compliance program? I mean, where where do they start? Thanks, Jimmy, and um, again, thanks to everybody for for your time today. It's you know, it is critical. So, so date, using data to help support uh, a compliance program. Is, is the imperative, you know, that, that's really what we're driving at here. Um, and it's not just a turnkey or a flip of a switch that you can all of a sudden use, you know, use data to enhance your program. The first thing that we often see is the most effective is uh, when designing a data-driven uh, compliance program is to determine what data exists or what data doesn't exist. And, you know, what insights can be gleaned from the data that is available um, or you know, where are the gaps in that process? So it's really important to know where you stand before you start out on your kind of enhanced journey. Um, now we know nearly all companies have quantitative financial data, um, which is available from their accounting or, or ERP systems, which we often use to identify trends and patterns and outliers that can be helpful to detect you know, improper or unexpected activity. But there's, there's other data sources as well, uh, other qualitative data sources. Uh, that are used to make decisions about financial transactions, uh, such as gifts and entertainment. Um, but that type of data is often captured in an unstructured or more inaccessible way that does not lend itself to easy analysis or monitoring. So it's important to evaluate you know, what data is likely to yield greater insights and what data will help assess the adherence of your compliance program or help you identify potential violations or red flags you know, within the organization. Uh, so starting out with that kind of understanding is really what you need to do versus running into uh, trying to implement something heavy, heavy technology or heavy you know, data oriented. Um, now, the other thing is when you're starting off with developing or looking to enhance your compliance program, you don't want to boil the ocean. You don't want to try to analyze every risk imaginable. This can often leave you with a program that's more mediocre or over engineered that provides minimal assurance because we're trying to accomplish too much with too little. Um, and, and that type of approach is often gonna leave you in a worse case because you may have more data available to you and not the ability to react to it. 
So rather than, than trying to boil the ocean, instead focus on the highest risk areas and identify the data that would be needed to support those highest risk areas. And then identify risks where improved data collection needs to occur to better assess those risk areas that you don't currently have enough uh, information for. So starting off on the right direction is, is really critical to establishing a program that's going to be effective and that's going to align you know, with those pillars that we've been talking about so far. And then once you've done that, then analyzing the right data can act actually help you tell whether your compliance program is functioning or, the, or whether there may be gaps um, to help you identify issues before they can turn into to major events. Now, as an example, I, I recently worked with a chief compliance officer who really wanted to better understand the risks of their business using data and analytics. He wanted to be able to spot and react to events or trends in a timely manner, you know, in accordance with the DOJ guidance, but he didn't know how to accomplish that. And, and what we did was we worked with them to help evaluate the risks for, of the organization through a series of strategic discussions and interviews with the, the various business unit leaders or responsible managers to confirm what they were seeing on the ground. This allowed them to you know, compare that you know, compliance top-down view of the business with the bottoms-up approach to really you know, reconcile what are the, the, the areas that pose the greatest risk to the organization. This is all before you start to implement analytics and before you start to implement your data, because uh, it's critical to start on that right path. Uh, and what they found was there was areas where the business was making decisions about products and pricing or, or margins that were not captured electronically, you know, related to customer orders and sales. So it was impossible for them from a compliance standpoint to really detect the higher risk, you know, in the markets where they felt they were exposed uh, or they were providing, you know, discounts or free of charge goods that could be potentially considered as inappropriate, you know, transfer of values or even corruption schemes. So as a result of that evaluation, the company is now looking to you know, enhance their data collection controls, you know, better standardize the processes so they can start on the journey of implementing data and analytics to better detect and prevent you know, those types of uh, those risk areas. So it really is a journey from establishing uh, a baseline of, of what and where you know, everything is, and then assessing what those risks are, how they impact your business, and then determining you know, what are the, the mitigating risk factors uh, to really allow you to be defensible you know, with your overall program. So Jim, we can go ahead and move to the uh, next slide unless there's any questions. Sure, and, and I guess just, you know, you, you started talking about, Brian, some, some of the sources of data, and I think, you know, some of these are, some, some of them are more obvious than others, you know, your accounting, your ERP data, your, your T&E, and that sort of thing. But, you know, what other sources do most companies have access to, you know, understanding that, you know, uh, an entity is going to do its risk assessment and, and maybe target its, its, its data collection or analysis to, to the areas of highest risk, but what other sources are out there that maybe not are, are, are not as readily apparent mm -hmm. to folks that might yield, uh, you know, useful information because God knows we're, we're bombarded with lots of information. Uh, but, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, we're, again, we're, maybe we're lawyers, we're other sorts of, we're accountants, we're compliance professionals. I mean, what do we do with this? Where do we start? What else is out there? Yeah, Jimmy, mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem for most organizations. Um, most large organizations have grew by acquisition. They may have disparate systems. They may have multiple versions of different ERP systems. Uh, they could have systems that are not you know, easily connected where information doesn't flow between them. Uh, so it, it really is a challenge. It's, it, like I mentioned before, it's not a turnkey solution to drop in a, a compliance analytics program and have it function. Uh, you know, it's really important to, to kind of build your strategy of how you're going to accomplish those goals. And one of our kind of guiding principles is to start small, you know, start small with data that's available, start small with data that will help you assess the risks that you've identified that are, are you know, maybe higher, higher risk, maybe not the highest risk, depending on, on, you know, the availability of that data. Um, and one of the most common places that, that folks will start is looking at employee travel and entertainment. You know, especially with uh, DOJ inquiries, you know, oftentimes um, looking at the behavior of the business and how the, the employees are traveling, you know, where they're spending, you know, the corporate dollars can be a significant indicator uh, of risk. And, and this data is often easier to understand. You know, we, we all travel, we've all submitted our own expenses. Uh, so we kind of know how to read and understand that data, you know, as compared to other maybe financial data or more complex data that's going through um, you know, multiple layers of, of business processes that's really more difficult to assess 
is this a risk or is it not a risk? Um, and, and when we're looking at things like employee expenses, there's, there's always the low hanging fruit of you know, looking at high risk interactions, whether you are a life sciences company and you're concerned about health, healthcare provider interactions or uh, generally with government or state owned entities uh, or other just high risk third parties, you know, whether there's adverse media related to a third party you're doing business with or distributors. Um, you know, we can look at all that, that type of activity and are, are, are our employees interacting with them? Are we taking them out for meals? Are they uh, buying services with them that maybe should go through procurement that are being expensed you know, otherwise? So there's lots of different things that you can glean uh, from employee information. Um, now that information can also be augmented you know, with, other, with other data and other systems. So ERP and financial data, you know, it's generally available to most organizations, um, but you know, that financial data is often fairly limited you know, with the amount of detail that's captured in a, in a journal entry or in a, or in a payment uh, request. Um, most of the data that supports kind of the purpose uh, for those, uh, those types of transactions may be offline in, in documents you know, or other registries, such as a gift or entertainment registry. So if you're looking at employee expenses and whether uh, they're taking out clients for, for particular you know, services, you know, did they follow protocols? Was that, was that entertainment meal approved by compliance? Did it fall within the spectrum of the compliance guidelines, whether it's frequency or you know, aggregated amount or just general amount? Um, and looking at those you know, expenses, like I mentioned before, is often easier to assess as you're starting to get your bearings for how do we uh, develop you know, analytics that would you know, help us detect these events that could be you know, risky. Um, you know, other systems that can often be helpful are, you know, document management systems, you know, you know, for invoices or, you know, email data, especially, again, if you're a financial services organization and you have, you know, email requirements for capture, you know, looking at just simple keywords um, and things of that nature to help you detect risk. Um, not every, you know, analysis, not every data set needs to be quantitative in nature. It doesn't have to be numbers or amounts or dates. It can also be qualitative. So if you're looking at email data, for instance, you might want to look at you know, high-risk language uh, or keywords that could be captured within that descriptive text. It could be on you know, uh, document data from your vendors or it could be uh, emails from your employees. So setting up you know, those types of uh, less quantitative checks can help you evaluate you know, whether our, our employee population is adhering to the, the guidelines that we've defined in our, our policies and procedures you know, and whether there's regional differences, are we seeing issues in a particular market? Uh, is it related to specific products that we, uh, that we deliver or sell? Uh, and looking at those, those behaviors can be really important to assess, you know, do we need to enhance the program? Do we need to, you know, establish additional control or, or changing our controls? And for more advanced, um, you know, organizations, they can mix or marry the advanced analytics to combine both the structured data and the unstructured data. So you can extract information about you know, what's being discussed in unstructured data. Um, you know, we often call that natural language processing or text analytics, where you might want to extract you know, what's being talked about in particular documents or emails or, or other textual data related to um, you know, financial transactions. Uh, so bringing, you know, bridging the gap between that quantitative and qualitative information can really drive efficiency um, you know, for your compliance program. And as an example of that, we, we actually worked with a client to help them develop an analytic solution that would compare the employee expense data with email correspondence to identify potential activity that might be fictitious or overrepresented. Uh, and this allowed the compliance team to follow higher risk activity to determine if there were potential training issues for these employees. You know, were they just not aware of the, the risks that they were creating? Um, did they did they rubber stamp their, their compliance um, acknowledgements or did they just not even take the compliance training at all? Uh, or on the, on the kind of the other side of it is, are they committing fraud or, or corruption within the organization? Uh, so you know, bringing together some of those disparate data sets can really be impactful you know, as you're designing these solutions. And again, a lot of it comes back to uh, what are the risks of the organization uh, that we see? You know, do those risks vary by region and, and what data do we have? Uh, to evaluate those risks. Um, because if you just pick data and try to run with it, then, then the value of the analytics that you're, you're going to apply you know, may not be as effective as what you would, you would like to uh, obtain. Uh, so really important there to kind of uh, evaluate that and, and start with the things that you feel are gonna give you, you know, the best bang for your buck. Well, 
So and thanks, for, thanks for walking us through that, Brian. But I guess, you know, now, Shuba, how do we, you know, how, how does an entity, big or small, how do they take all these different disparate sources of information, you know, from human resources systems, say their, their ethics hotline, their training expenses, how do you combine and analyze that data so you get it to something that's understandable and that's potentially usable for, for either detecting or preventing uh, a compliance issue? Uh, on a go-forward basis. Right. Um, thanks, Jimmy, for the question, and good morning, everyone. Um, so let's talk about some tactical steps in leveraging data while keeping in mind the strategic direction that your organization wants to take in proactively monitoring for compliance risks. So organizations should start by prioritizing business areas that are vulnerable to compliance risks that they may want to begin monitoring for such risks. And the compliance risks may differ in nature. Some might be driven by employee behavior. Uh, some might be driven by third party, transactional activity, workforce, health and safety, environmental, so on and so forth. But upon identifying the business areas and the related business processes, the different data sources that govern these processes have to be inventory. And these data sets may be of varying formats. As Brian mentioned, some come as structured data and some present themselves as unstructured data. Just a quick definition of what we mean by structured and unstructured data is that data that manipulates in the form of rows and columns within data tables that typically reside in your enterprise systems or applications are called structured data sets. And unstructured data is usually PDF images, videos, voice messages, text messages, log files from systems and free text fields. So it is important to categorize the relevant data sources into structured and unstructured formats because this enables consolidation of data sets. And assessing these data sets for quality, integrity and accessibility is a key step in the process of consolidating multiple data sources. Data acquisition is performed to transfer these data sets from your source systems, which are typically enterprise applications or homegrown systems into a consolidated data repository, often referred to as data mark or data lakes. And these data marks or data lakes can serve compliance fun functions exclusively for their needs. Now, this also provides an added advantage where compliance functions are still able to maintain their data privacy, security, and confidentiality of not just the data sources that they are leveraging, but also the analytics outcomes, which may be sensitive in nature. The second point um, here is data validation. When these source systems are tapped off uh, different data sets, data validation is an important step because that informs the analysts of the different types of tests and analysis that can be carried on based on the data quality and reliability. Collaborating with the business process and data owners to gain a good understanding of the business processes that are in play and also any unique business scenarios that may exist within a certain geography or across countries is key. And this is a very important step in leveraging data to perform the analysis because when there is no good understanding of the business process or data, what happens here is it is almost guaranteed to generate a huge number of false positives. And false positives often drain a lot of energy and resources when people are compliance personnel are assigned to perform follow-up on such analytics findings. So in order to increase the accuracy of the analytics that you perform, it is highly recommended that you gain a good understanding of the underlying business process and data sets before you execute your analytics. And once you design, customize and execute your analytics test procedures, the results of your analytics findings are typically subjected to an evaluation process. And what this process allows you to do is it allows you to confirm the analytics outcome and generate actionable insights. These insights could vary anywhere from 
you know, um, looking at revising policies and procedures, um, establishing additional controls, uh, closing gaps within the existing business processes, or um, pushing out additional awareness to employees uh, through trainings and other means of communication. So this takes you one full cycle of your analytics journey. And at the end of this exercise, you now have a set of analytics test procedures that can then be operationalized within an organization to perform a continuous monitoring, meaning you can now execute these analytics procedures on a periodic or a continuous basis. And this allows you to reduce or minimize manual intervention by exploring automation in not just acquiring the data sets, but executing the analytics and publishing your analytics findings uh, in various um, ways, such as dashboards um, or um, Excel extracts or through a case management functionality. Continuous monitoring solutions are good examples for repeatable analytics. Anytime you set up your analytics um, in, a, in a repeatable manner, you instantaneously drive efficiency and effectiveness of the overall process. When some of these best practices and robust methodologies are missed while establishing your analytics capabilities, it often becomes a cumbersome exercise for organizations um, and is a long running process to get your analytics capabilities stood up. Right, so I'd like to just pause for a second because we've gotten several great questions from, from our audience. And so, Brian, I, I guess one of the questions we've got, which is a really great point since we're all still living in some sort of you know pandemic lockdown, hopefully easing and maybe in some places easing more than other places. But you know, after a year or more of, of being under things like travel restrictions, how do you go and baseline for something like a t and &E expense, especially when in, I don't know, in 2020, lots of those expenses probably went down to zero or near zero for, for lots of folks. There's, you know, virtually no business travel. Certainly, um, you know, maybe you could expense the, the Zoom happy hour or the Zoom wine tasting. But, you know, other than those sorts of things, you know, how, how would you go about baselining starting, you know, as we start to reopen, as we start to get back to, you know, hopefully what's a more normal business business pattern? Yeah, Jimmy, I, I actually like that question. Um, this has come up, you know, for us a few different times uh, with, a, with a couple of different clients. Um, you know, if you have an existing um, program that's set up to monitor for, uh, you know, T&E, you know, activity, you basically can throw it out the window, right? It's, um, it's not going to detect a, you know, once in a hundred year um, pandemic and, and know how to deal with that. So, We've um, we've been helping clients kind of deal with that of how do we how do we modify and adjust to this this fluctuation in in expense activity how do we now assess whether our, our employees are you know doing things or or deviating from what we would expect now most companies their policies didn't change in terms of you know what they expense um, or or how they expense it we've seen a, a bit of a change on you know, maybe some of the amounts or what people are expensing. So obviously there's been nearly no travel. Um, so anyone who's traveling, you know, that's gonna be a bit more uh, suspicious whether people are you know, taking you know, cars, trains or, or planes. Um, those things are so infrequent that they can of, often just be looked at you know, manually. And um, we've seen you know, companies and, and helped companies quickly um, you know, modify some of their analytics to, then, to monitor for those types of things. But then the other part of it is, um, how do we, if let's say you're a, uh, a frontline facing company and you didn't have as much fluctuations in your, in your travel and entertainment, but just the general behavior of our employees are differing. You know, we have to pay for PPE materials. We have to pay for other cleaning, um, cleaning products that we didn't you know, previously paid for. So we're seeing spikes in, in areas that would you know, traditionally have not have spiked. Uh, and those are effectively false positives. So rebaselining, um, and, and I said it somewhat tongue in cheek, uh, you do have to ignore uh, the the prior kind of baselines that you've calculated uh, before the pandemic and kind of rebaseline. Um, you know, the good thing is, if you have enough data, you can still apply the statistical analyses that help you detect, you know, outlier behavior. You know, quantitatively, that's still a bit, you know, a bit straight, more straightforward. 
uh, but we also you know, can update the behavioral analytics that we apply. That's often not looking at specific indicators of risk, but looking at just the general combinations of what activities are being performed. So when we often design a, a T&E type monitoring uh, solution, we may have particular risks that we look for, like hard and fast rules that you know you can't expense a meal over this amount, or you're not you can't um, expense a, a plane ticket in first class, or you know whatever the requirements are, you know of the company. Uh, so those hard and fast rules may exist, but then when we start to analyze and model that behavior, the the models are smart enough to learn as long as they're tuned or re retuned to look at the the relative behavior of the other employees. Uh, so what we've what we've done in these scenarios is help the, our clients to re readjust their models and, and look for those behavioral fluctuations. Um, as, again, as long as you have enough data, you don't want to take the sledgehammer uh, approach to a population of data that can be reviewed in an Excel file. Um, you know, if you have a very small number of employees, it doesn't make sense to build a robust you know analytics model that's going to tell you you know maybe less than what you could even analyze by going through 100 lines of, of transactions. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so it's it's kind of marrying and balancing the effort uh, of adjusting for the pandemic impacts on, on the financial area, as well as adjusting the analytics that you're doing and, and looking at, you know, what do we see in those trends? And my, my process had been, let's look at what your current process is detecting. Let's assess how far off, you know, or what we call model drift. So how far has the model drifted? from detecting relevant risk and where do we think the, um, the, the risk needs to be adjusted to get us back into kind of the lanes for what we're seeing in the pandemic. Um, and that's often just really looking at, you know, a smaller subset of data and potentially looking at different techniques, you know, for how to adjust for the pandemic. And then going forward, uh, what we've been discussing with folks is, you know, whether or not to exclude the data that we've analyzed from the pandemic period. So as we start to return to normality, you know, for the models and the risk analytics that we've been developing, you know, do we take out that, you know, 12, 15, 18 month period that is effectively going to be an outlier in and, in and of its own to the expected business operations. So that also depends on whether your organization is going to go back to normality. Are you gonna to continue to have people traveling or uh, are you gonna to continue to have employees acting as they were before? Oftentimes what I expect is it's gonna be a hybrid. Uh, you can't necessarily throw away all your old data. You can't necessarily rely on the new data exactly, but you need to find that middle ground of, you know, what is the new normal? Uh, and it's almost akin to starting over of, you know, how do we reframe and re-baseline the population and what techniques will help us get us there? Yeah, I think, listen, we've all, uh, you know, we've all in the last 13 or 14 months have certainly used the term new normal in just about every facet of our business and professional lives. Um, and so, you know, just like anything else, I, I think we're embarking into the unknown on a go forward basis as we transition back to, you know, back to the office and back to our business travel or whatever form it's going to look like. Uh, I want to take one other question and then we'll, we'll jump back into the presentation. But again, I think it's a, it's an interesting question. And maybe John, you could you could answer this one. Uh, you know, we, we Brian talked about how you know the SEC and other regulators use their own data analytics and software and what have you to try and mine for leads, investigative leads. And I guess in, in terms of what 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 are the sorts of things that you've heard that the federal government? Obviously, we we don't know the secret sauce for sure. But you know, what have you heard that the federal government relies on? You know, in maybe the accounting or the financial reporting context or other contexts. What are they looking? Sure. I mean, it's an excellent question, right? And and we've had a lot of sort of vague comments by, um, you know, the, the deputy attorney generals and, and other high level DOJ officials over the years and also SEC enforcement um, about the types of data that they're looking at and how it's helped them to investigate certain types of crimes. You know, for example, healthcare fraud is one area where um, they very actively used uh, um, data analytics to try to identify, you know, billing patterns or outliers when it comes to Medicare or Medicaid billing, um, things like that, um, where they've been using a lot of data analytics to do that for years. Um, similarly, um, you know, in, in, in the case of drug diversion and things like that, there is data that's collected by DEA that they can look at. Financial frauds we've talked about. The SEC, um, obviously, has, has a well-developed program of looking at trading patterns 
and determining whether or not there's potential insider trading or other types of market manipulation going on. Um, but as a general matter, what I've heard most recently from uh, you know current DOJ officials, so this is this is Biden administration officials, is that uh, they are going to be looking at all the different data sets that they have available to the federal government. Um, you know, they're not actively going out and trying to claw on new data necessarily, but if there's data that's already being collected by a government agency or a regulator, um, they're going to try to use that as a data set for them to then run some sort of analytical function on to figure out whether or not there's suspicious patterns or outliers or trends um, that they then need to focus on. Um, so, you know, they'll, they'll first try to identify the pattern or trend and then they'll the, just like I think we're going to get into a little more when we talk about how compliance programs should uh, handle investigations uh, at companies, government's doing the same thing. Um, now, are they doing this all in-house or are they doing it outsourced? I, I know there's been a lot of reporting and comments um, in certain areas about how, you know, they're, they're contracting with certain companies that are experts in this area. And I'm not going to name any companies because I don't want to either plug or disparage anybody out there. Uh, but... Um, but I think it is true that, you know, to the extent the government doesn't have the resources to do data mining or things like that for big data sets, um, they are going out and either, you know, getting licenses on software that's already out there, or they're contracting with companies to develop um, the capabilities to, to do the data mine they need. Uh, but, you know, I think for this audience, the, the thing to recognize is, you know, look, if there is data that is currently being disclosed to the government in some fashion, whatever your regulator is, whatever your primary regulator is, um, you know, you should expect that that data uh, is going to be, you know, mined in some sense and analyzed by the government. And so if they're going to do it, you should do it as well, um, just to get ahead of the curve. And they're going to expect you to, because otherwise they're not going to th- they're not going to, to, to find that you guys have done everything you can to create an effective, modern, updated program that adequately uh, looks at all the facts and that's well resourced. So, and, and so I guess on, on that point, I'd like to transition back to the next slide. Um, and, you know, we've heard, you know, we've talked about risk assessments and, you know, and that's sort of being the starting point for, for most organizations in, in trying to figure out, you know, where do they allocate their compliance resources? Where are the high risk locations, jurisdictions, high risk lines of business? I guess, you know, John, just continuing on that thread, um, you know, what is the DOJ going to expect? How, how do you incorporate data to the extent you weren't incorporating it before, or, you know, maybe we're sort of incorporating it, but had no formal process. How, how does, what's the DOJ going to expect on, on how that factors into, you know, a company's risk assessment and what its high or low risk regions or businesses are? Sure. I mean, look, I think one thing we should take a step back here, and if this hasn't been said already, I think we need to, to say it now, which is that, you know, there is no one size fits all approach right, to, to risk assessment or to corporate compliance programs. Um, and DOJ has made it very clear that they recognize that, uh, that every company is going to be different and, and there's going to be different risks based on, you know, your, your particular industry, uh, as well as your geographical location um, and, and, and the types of transactions that you engage in, who your partners are, those sorts of things. Um, and so that's always been a fundamental part of, you know, designing a, 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 a well-designed and effective risk-based compliance program. Um, so, d- you know, the, the use of data is really just an enhancement on that, right? It's, it's a capability for a company um, to, you know, monitor its risks and, and, and have some sort of qualitative analysis of where the risk really is. And they can incorporate that into their, n- you know, normal otherwise risk assessment programs. Um, as, as I think Chris and Brian said earlier, you know, the other thing DOJ has been emphasizing uh, for a while now is that, you know, it's not enough just to set up a program with a risk assessment um, when you first start your compliance program and then, you know, not go back to it, right? Just, 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 just assume you have the same risks that you started out with. Um, that's not going to be considered to be an effective program. And similarly, if you do just periodic audits, um, that may no longer be seen as an effective program. What they're expecting is, you know, continuous updating, continuous analysis. And in order to do that, you really do need the data. You need to be able to take the data that the business side is generating and look at that from a risk perspective 
um, and then evaluate and change your program uh, in real time uh, to the best that you can. And so of course that begs the question, Shuba and Chris, like how do we, so how do we incorporate the data, you know, we've identified all these sources, we've run the processes, we've right sized it so we can, you know, you know, analyze it and understand it. How do we incorporate that into into a risk assessment or, or an organization's enterprise risk assessment? Sure. I, and I'll start and pass it over to Shuva. Um, and Jonathan, I think, uh, captured it. Uh, the, the government's expecting something beyond a point in time assessment. And they're moving towards continuous. I, I think if you read the language in, in the revised guidelines, you'd almost think you'd be doing a risk assessment every day. And I don't think that's the intent. I think the intent is that they want the compliance function to react to new information as it becomes available. So yes, they have access to the data, um, but if there's an event that drives a change in, in risk, that the compliance program analyzes that event and determines how it should be incorporated into the compliance program or how the compliance program should be modified to address that risk. And you know, examples I mentioned earlier, you know, if you've got an M&A transaction, the business you acquire could be very different in terms of how it goes to market, how it interacts with government officials than your existing legacy business. And you have to adapt your compliance program at that point in time to address those risks. And then you have to be able to monitor the activity of that acquired entity because you need to integrate them into your compliance program. Or if you have an investigation, you know, th there's a, a fairly high degree of, of, of concern on the part of the government that when there's an investigation, that organizations evaluate the findings of that, that investigation. They understand who was involved in that process. They do appropriate remediation, but they also look to see if that, that investigation implicates any other part of the business. So maybe it's an investigation in, in, in in what one country in Africa, how have you evaluated whether or not that practice is, you know, across that region or around the world? And so they want you to be able to evaluate that, determine if you need to make changes in, in your compliance program and your, your policies and procedures, and you monitor to make sure that the, the issue you identified in, in country A isn't being repeated in country B. So that, that's generally the, the overview where they're going. And then Shuba, if you wanna talk about the data sources and, and how we analyze that. Sure, thanks, Chris. You know, there are numerous ways to incorporate data into risk assessments, but let's take a step back to understand the objective of risk assessments, right? The objectives here is to identify, prioritize, and assign accountability for managing existing and emerging risks whether it's related to regulatory, legal, or policy non-compliance, or even ethical misconduct. This can result in penalties, reputational damage, or inability to operate in some key markets for certain businesses, right? With that said, the types of data sets that can be brought into or incorporated into risk assessments include a company's internal data, or otherwise known as enterprise data or operational data, along with external data sources. So let's talk about external data first. Background checks, screening, adverse media reviews, um, survey questionnaires, all provide data sources for, from an external point of view to assess an organization's risk and allowing organizations to increase their risk sensing capabilities in a proactive manner. When you talk about internal data or enterprise data, these data sets help understand the operational profile for a business in a particular geography, country, region. And some of these key data elements that you will find within a company's operational data set includes you know, revenue for a particular business operating in a region, number of employees, number of contractors, number of expats, your capex spend, procurement spend, so on and so forth. Now, these data points in and of itself help determine an inherent risk factor associated with a certain geography or a business line operating in a certain region. And this information coupled with transactional data sets, uh, which are essentially um, invoices, payments, purchase orders, or expense transactions, will start painting a risk profile um, for 
your third parties or your entities of interest that is more robust and holistic in nature because it not only looks at your enterprise data but also brings in an outside in view. And by analyzing the key data sets, um, such as hotline, statistical transactional records, audit findings, compliance assessments, exceptional reports, an organization can actually gain a deeper understanding of both emerging risks and existing risks. Another key element or data point to incorporate into risk assessments come from the past incidents or investigations or audit outcomes, um, lessons learned while performing or monitoring for compliance risks. These are essentially your early warnings of emerging risks within certain business areas, geographies, countries, or regions. And these are often captured or analyzed using advanced analytics techniques. And what I mean by advanced analytics techniques is we don't necessarily leverage the normal rules-based uh, analysis. Instead, we look at more exploratory analysis where the data is tapping on your shoulders to tell you where the outliers and the anomalies and the exceptions lie. In fact, the concept of machine learning and predictive analytics revolve around information that an organization captures around past incidents or outcome of past risk assessments, employee misconduct, bribery, corruption, or any kind of compliance violation that they may have experienced in the past. And the ability for a machine to learn each and every attribute of a bad actor or a bad act, to then go into the general population of transactional activities, to look at entities that are exhibiting same similar behavior is basically or essentially termed as the predictive analytics. And this concept leverages what we call machine learning. Now, Brian will talk a little bit more detail around some of these concepts, but I wanna emphasize the importance of using the lessons learned or information from past incidents, schemes, or bad act to also proactively monitor for such compliance risks. And this is a big role that data can bring about and play in terms of accurately identifying some of the risks that are waiting to happen. Incorporating data into risk assessments also allow for a robust correlation analysis between information that can be gathered through interviews versus actual transactional activities. So for example, if a survey response around uh, gifts and entertainment around government official comes back telling that there was no such entertainment, but you do see transactional activity associated with gifts and entertainment in that particular country region, then that basically tells you that your correlation analysis is picking up exceptions. While we extensively discussed the use of data for risk assessments, let's not forget the role of technology enablement of a risk assessment process in the mix. And what we mean by technology enablement is if the risk assessment process is conducted traditionally through interviews, brainstorming sessions, and a lot of sampling activity from a transactional testing standpoint, leveraging technology enablement to perform risk assessments from start to finish through the same technologies or tools in play will allow you to maintain a single version of truth so that you're able to leverage information from your past risk assessments and your current risk assessments in one place, maintaining a single version of truth. So technology enablement goes in hand in hand with data analytics, because the more technology enabling that takes place of manual processes, the more data that is being generated that can be analyzed downstream. So, and you know, so Shuva, you, you touched on machine learning and artificial intelligence, I guess, Pat, what's the, what's the current state of play briefly on, uh, you know, from a regulatory standpoint of how, AI and machine learning should factor into compliance processes or, or, or an organization's compliance program? 
Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, now we're starting to get into the more advanced, advanced data analytics part of our programming. Uh, I'm going to save the advanced stuff for my colleagues at Deloitte, but just to touch on a few things um, with respect to, uh, you know, regulations uh, that may be coming down the road or what regulators are paying attention to now with respect to machine learning and AI. I mean, it's a hot topic, a uh, very hot topic it, across many different industries, across many different compliance areas. Uh, you know, in one regard, uh, a lot of companies look to AI and machine learning to enhance their complying, compliance monitoring systems. So Shuba touched on this. Uh, a big area is anti-corruption AML monitoring. Uh, can you create a technology uh, that using an algorithm will reliably predict when a certain practice or activity will lead to corrupt conduct uh, or, anti or money laundering, uh, AI? Uh, or can you feed data uh, that you have into a program that automatically uh, identifies markers of misconduct, red flags, sort of, you know, along the lines of machine learning. And, uh, you know, com you know, and uh, many people have, uh, have uh, identified machine learning as a, as a subcategory category of uh, artificial intelligence. It's not only a compliance monitoring, companies also look to AI and machine learning to qualify consumers for certain products they provide, loan products and things like that. Uh, AI and machine learning can also, also use in the healthcare space to develop drugs, uh, reach uh, treatment decisions, decide on patient care. So it's, it's you know, cuts across various industries. It's cutting edge stuff. But of course, there are a lot of things to think about uh, when using AI and machine learning. Uh, it, it's great uh, when, it, when it works out and when, when you're using the right algorithms and the right data sources, and it can really enhance your compliance program. Uh, but, you know, one big thing to consider uh, is whether you're complying with data privacy and cybersecurity rules. So by definition, uh, AI and machine uh, learning uh, use data, use rule sets, use parameter sets. Uh, so, you know, where is that data coming from? Uh, is it coming from a location and going to another location that are subject to data privacy rules? Who, who is it coming from? Uh, so, you know, and are there rules that relate to automated decisions uh, that you you have to, uh, you know, be concerned about? So it really takes, uh, you know, um, uh, a good, you know, companies should take a good look and study uh, the GDPR, California um, privacy law, uh, and, you know, uh, determine that there, if you're using uh, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning, that, that you're complying with the, with the data privacy laws. You know, for instance, the GDPR, uh, I think it's Article 22, uh, states that data subjects shall have the right not to be subject to decisions based solely on automated processing. Uh, there are additional requirements and exceptions and consumers can consent, but that's, that's an example that companies need to you know, be aware of. Same thing with the California privacy um, law, uh, which requires regulations um, governing access and opt-out rights with respect to businesses using automated decision-making technology. Uh, you know, so uh, another area uh, that, you know, companies should be aware of is whether, uh, you know, the use of, the, of these advanced technologies runs afoul of any consumer protection laws. And relatedly, which is a big topic now, is whether uh, they uh, can lead to, um, you know, discriminatory decisions or, or whether the, you know, the, the, the rules, the algorithms, the data sets that are used uh, whether consciously or unconsciously or subconsciously um, have biases built in. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, you know, the, the, the technology is just going to perpetuate the bias. So a lot of care should be taken when developing, you know, the parameters for AI, the algorithms, the data sets that are used in machine learning, um, you know, just to watch out for, um, for, for any, any biases that, that, that may be incorporated in there. Um, and, you know, from a, from a, regulatory perspective, I mentioned the privacy, uh, consumer protection, you know, also cybersecurity, of course, you know, you know, special care should be taken to make sure that these systems are secure. Uh, you know, on the slide, you'll see that regulators in the financial industry are taking a, a particularly close look at this. There was just a uh, request for comment issued by the Fed, OCC, the FDIC, and the CFPP on how financial institutions use AI and the controls they have in place and whether any clarifications from regulators would be helpful. This leads me to believe that regulations are coming down the road. The, the agencies are giving a chance to the public to comment, I think. Uh, also, uh, just a couple of days ago, the House Financial Services Committee uh, formed a task force on the use of AI 
So you'll see, I think, uh, investigations and uh, probably reports uh, coming out of that process. So I think, you know, there, there are sort of regulations in place now, privacy related, of course, to the anti-discrimination laws uh, that companies uh, certainly should, should be aware of uh, when using AI and machine learning. But also, you know, I think there's going to be additional regulations coming down, in particular, particularly in the financial um, services space that, that may further regulate um, the use of AI and machine learning and perhaps, you know, require more transparency in the process. Uh, and the, so that companies ensure that, you know, the, the AI, the, the data and the parameters and the rules um, that are, are incorporated into uh, this advanced technology doesn't lead to any, you know, um, you know, uh, decisions that have discriminatory impacts. Yeah, really interesting stuff, Pat. And I guess, Brian, you know, is this, how do you incorporate, you know, AI? Can you incorporate AI and machine learning into compliance programs? Or is it really just, you know, is it science fiction? I mean, how, how does this, how does, how, how are you seeing this work in practice with, with your clients and with the entities you advise? It is definitely not, not science fiction. Otherwise, I, I probably wouldn't have a lot to do. Um, but, but these approaches have been around for, for decades. You know, most of the AI and machine learning algorithms were developed back in the 70s. And the big difference is the, the um, improvement in technology has now allowed us to apply them in different and more unique scenarios, you know, especially within the compliance world. Uh, but not everything requires an AI or ML solution. Um, and, and as Shuba mentioned, these, these techniques and these approaches require information to learn from. So if you don't have information to train a model to better detect risk, then implementing an AI model probably won't give you very good uh, uplift to your risk detection. So it's even though it's been easier to use these tools, they still need to be fit for purpose. Um, you know, just because there's a lot of hype over AI and ML, it's not the first thing that I recommend you know, when I'm speaking to clients. We really have to evaluate you know, does it make sense for the organization? Do you have enough historical data to consider using an AI or ML model? You know, or is it going to just you know output noise? Um, the, the the most advanced uh, organizations are definitely using them. Uh, those organizations that have tracked you know risks uh, you know through internal audit or through compliance, they have examples of transactions or examples of employees or other scenarios that you can start to model on. Uh, you know, that's really more on the predictive side. Now, most organizations can uh, also model for anomalies. That's it's still under the machine learning umbrella, but it, it, again, it depends on, on the robustness of the data and, and whether the outliers that the models detect are actually relevant to the risks of the organization. So that's why we kind of go back and we say, you know, what, what's the data, what's the risks, and then let's, let's try, to uh, try to identify what analyses are going to give you the best, the best output. And you know, one of the biggest risks I see for organizations is trying to you know, find an off the shelf tool or, or an analytic that will just plug the hole that they're fearing. Um, and, and that really gives you vanilla, you know, vanilla output, you know, which is really just not impactful. Um, it's not mitigating the risks that, that you're really trying to accomplish. And that, that's also going back to the reason why we start small. Start small with risks that you can get your hands around um, you know, design a plan around, you know, where you're going to go with your analytics and your, um, in your data to give you a proper plan for how you to get to more mature, but you can't, you can't kind of just jump from zero to a hundred, you know, with analytics, it's not going to give you that kind of, um, that acceleration. Um, you can get some significant acceleration, but it really does need to be fit for purpose. Um, and I also a little bit too, what I think uh, Patrick um, was talking about before is there's regional differences, you know, within the organizations, or as Chris mentioned, as you're acquiring different companies, you know, you may need to implement different models for different regions to detect the risks of how they, they operate. You know, what are the local issues there? You know, what's the local, you know, policies or just how do people interact with each other? If I build a machine learning model and I build it over all the data in my organization, is it really going to detect risk in my LATAM you know, operations or in my U.S. operations, you know, do I need to build an AI or ML, ML model for those particular operations so that I can detect, uh, you know, outliers, anomalies, or similar patterns of behavior that we've seen in the past? So definitely something we're helping clients do. And we are seeing clients implement them successfully. Um, you know, higher volume companies can often benefit from more AI and ML just because they have more data. Um, you know, smaller companies or, or companies with less transactional volume 
you know, may often want to start with more simple, uh, simple techniques and work their way up to, to the more advanced ones. And I, I guess, Shuva, just briefly, if you could tell us, what are some of the common pitfalls to avoid when building, when an organization is building a compliance analytics program? Sure. I think it is important for organizations to realize that there are four critical components required to stand up an analytics program. They are the people, process, technology, and last but not the least, data. And it's important for all organizations to gain a good understanding of their current capabilities in all these four areas before they start. Let's start with people. As a company, do you have the right skill sets to run analytics in a sustained manner? Do you have dedicated resources, data scientists, forensic analysts um, with domain expertise, or are you operating in a shared resource model? All of this needs to be understood from a people standpoint in order to help execute on a compliance analytics program. And from a process standpoint, it's important for companies to understand or define the processes that are required for a compliance analytics program. The process of identifying, acquiring, analyzing data and reviewing the analytics findings all have to be established and streamlined in order for it to run like a well-oiled machine. Technology. Do we have the right tools and technologies in place to execute on analytics? More often than not, these analytics tools and technologies are available enterprise-wide in the larger organization, and the compliance functions should simply reach out to make the ask to leverage the same tools and technologies that the rest of the enterprise is using for, you know, whether it be marketing, customer segmentation, product strategy, what have you, right? Data. Access to data is critical for organizations to run a compliance analytics program. Do you have the right support from the data owners um, or your IT organization to obtain access to data is something that needs to be established from the get-go. Recognizing that organizations who are just starting their analytics journey may not necessarily have all the four key components in place, it's important for them to know that there are always better ways to smart, start small, leveraging smaller pilots, and then expand to support across different functions. Identify and prioritize the areas that you wanna focus your compliance analytics pilots, because that's very important to get started. But this goes back to what Brian previously mentioned about not boiling the ocean. For example, if your initial pilot is focused on you know, assessing your distributor's compliance or your vendor compliance or third parties, that is a good, pilot to get started with, and maybe you can further scope it down to a particular region, geography, um, across your business. And most importantly, always consider leveraging best practices and robust methodologies to drive efficiency and effectiveness within your analytics program. When you execute on your first analytics pilot and review the findings to action on them, you now have a sustainable pilot that can then be either operationalized on a continuous basis to run as a continuous monitoring solution or can be expanded to other areas of focus within the organization. The most important thing to remember is start small and scale smart. This is critical for you to sustain a compliance analytics program within your organization. Right. And, and listen, it's obviously, you know, organizations come in all different shapes and sizes. And so it's never a one size fits all. And, you know, one of the, one of the important things in, in, in the guidance is, is, you know, the DOJ acknowledges that and that it, lots of decision are going to be made based on the size of an organization, the resources that it has to bring to its compliance program. So always keep that in mind. You know, I think you've heard it multiple times from, you know, from, from the panelists is that, you know, it's not going to be one size fits all. And so, um, you know, getting it right up front is, is really critical. Um, but now I just wanted to turn to, you know, it's, it's almost in June, it'll be a year since that analytics was worked into the compliance guidance. And so I, I guess, Pat, tell us, you know, what's the, what's the DOJ's reaction been and how are they implementing that into, you know, corporate or 
criminal resolutions against corporate entities or other organizations? Sure. So for one, there, there's been more, you know, public announcements by high ranking officials focusing on the use of data analytics, both uh, that the government is using data analytics as we've heard throughout this presentation, but also uh, encouraging companies to do, to do so. Uh, one statement on the slide that I think is particularly important is a, a, um, a reference, uh, something that Charles Kane, the chief of the SEC's FCPA unit, uh, said a couple of days ago uh, at a Trace International uh, conference, where he says the key is that business side share its data with compliance. And, and I think that relates to a lot of the topics we've been talking about today. I mean, going back to the June 2020 guidance you know, one of the key questions is whether the compliance function has, has access to the data, and if it doesn't, why? Uh, and I think what we've been talking about today is how to utilize, where the sources of the data, how to bring them all together. And I think that was a really insightful comment, uh, you know, uh, that, that came in, or was a good takeaway in terms of where the regulators' heads are, but they're there, and, and they're saying that in their public announcements. And, and not to belabor the point, because I think it's been talked about for a while, but the government's using data. And, and another area, big area right now is in their Paycheck Protection Program and um, uh, Emergency uh, Disaster Loan Program, Loan for it, so PPP and EIDL. And uh, you know, the DOJ and the SBA have stated that they're using data analytics, uh, and they are. Um, they're applying thresholds that trigger scrutiny, they match data provided in loan applications to other data the government maintains on the applicant. Um, I think John mentioned this before, where they're pulling in resources and data from all different parts of the federal government. Uh, you know, inspector generals from different parts of the federal government, different agencies are collaborating on these cases, and and the data is being um, you know reviewed across government functions, uh, and they've been successful. You know, the 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 latest count that I saw was that uh, 209 individuals have been charged with PPP or EIDL fraud. Uh, in 119 cases for over 445 million in, in loans sought. So, um, you know, it's real. The, the government is using data and, I, and as, been, as has been said, I think by, by most of us, uh, the government will expect since they use it and they see the value in it, they'll, they expect the companies to take the same approach with their compliance programs. Uh, Jimmy, you could switch. And moving on now, the second thing that, that you see uh, are, uh, you know, resolutions. So uh, we've seen uh, resolutions in FCPA cases and in, in spoofing cases. Uh, spoofing is the practice of placing sham orders to artificially inflate or depress the value of a security and then making a trade on the opposite side of that order to take advantage of the manipulated price. Um, so in both of those areas, we've seen resolutions where, um, you know, there were violations, there were, you know, uh, corruption issues and there were spoofing uh, trades and, uh, you know, the DOJ would know that uh, there were alleged failures of internal controls, uh, which allowed this conduct to, to go undetected at the company, and then would enter into a uh, deferred prosecution agreement with the company that would include a requirement that going forward, the company use data analytics in its compliance program. And you see the way the DOJ has phrased that uh, in their deferred prosecution agreements on the slides which you know, is um, basically what they've been saying or what they did say in the June, to, to June 2020 guidelines. So clearly, you know, the companies that uh, enter into these deferred prosecution agreements have to incorporate data analytics uh, into their compliance programs because they're required to under the resolutions they reach with the DOJ. But this is also puts everybody else on notice on what the DOJ expects. Um, you know, with respect to uh, the use of data uh, in compliance programs, and you see these sort of requirements in, in their more, more recent resolutions. And I, and I guess just on, on that final point, it's, it's sort of a, remains to be seen, sort of stay tuned on how this is going to play out in practice. Because if you look at the DPAs that incorporate the guidance, basically it's, it's, it's a, you know, for lack of a better term, a cut and paste directly from the June 2020 update. And so it's the same language that's baked into the agreements. Um, there's no, there's nothing additional as to what's expected of a company because now it's in their deferred prosecution agreement. So they're affirmatively agreeing to do to incorporate data and provide data access uh, to inform its compliance program. And so again, there's not, unfortunately, there, there hasn't been, there, there was anything else in, in the three DPAs that have come out since that, since the guidance was changed to sort of inform us how, you know, or what the DOJ expects short of, 
you know, taking it out of the guidance and putting it in all three agreements, almost in the exact same places in each one of the one of the three agreements. So um, again, it's what it shows is it's on the radar. It's being taken seriously. Thought has gone into, you know, including that in the guidance. And I'm sure thought has gone into on the government side of how or what they expect the output to be from entities that have signed these 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 criminal resolutions, uh, you know, where they've gotten the benefit of a deferred prosecution or what have you. Um, I, I want to turn in the limited time we have left, I want to turn to the last sort of topic we have is, is, you know, how to use data in internal investigations. And so, you know, any good compliance program, part of that is going to be the investigation and remediation of, of either rules violations or some sort of potential misconduct. And so I guess, John, this question for you, uh, what is the government does or does it have an expectation that companies should start using data, data analytics in its internal investigations? Is that something that, you know, based on what's in the compliance guidance, is that something that, you know, should really alter the scope of an internal investigation or an investigative process? Well, I think they definitely expect you to rely on it. I don't know whether, I think most uh, companies now, particularly if you're, if you're dealing with, with, you know, forensic accountants or lawyers, I think they are already incorporating data in their analysis. Um, so I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation by DOJ that, that you do that. Um, but I, I think that um, clearly uh, they're going to, to look at it more carefully in terms of how you have identified and remediated um, any problems that do, do arise. Like, did you use data effectively to make sure that both in terms of scoping uh, of your investigation, um, as well as in the actual um, investigation itself, um, and then, as I think Chris mentioned earlier, once you're done with the investigation, um, you know, when you do some sort of root cause analysis uh, to make sure that you've actually figured out what the problems were, whether there were any gaps in your compliance programs and whatnot, um, they expect you to use data for that. So I think, you know, we've run through a lot of the different data sources that they would expect you to look at. Um, I think Brian, you know, went through, um, you know, the sales data, expense reimbursements, um, third party consultant payments are obviously a big issue that they would expect you to use data to go through. Um, the other thing, and I think somebody touched on this earlier, but I think it's also worth mentioning is, you know, to the extent that you're, you have a hotline uh, or you have any other, you know, um, complaint processes in place, you know, ticketing, that sort of thing, um, they would expect you as part of an investigation to go through that uh, and make sure you haven't missed something because perhaps there was, there was something that came in earlier that really didn't, um, you know, warrant an investigation. But now that you are doing an investigation in retrospect, it's something that you should have picked up on. Um, so that's another data source that they would expect you to analyze. Um, then in terms of the actual process of doing the investigation, one other thing that I think we may not mention yet is, you know, look, you're going to be dealing with a large uh, volume of materials and data, whether it's emails and, and texts and, and and, and, or financial documents. Um, and so you're not gonna be able to necessarily to review all of that. What we do all the time as lawyers and what you guys do as forensic accountants and whatnot. And so you can use data analytics to help you uh, with the sample selection process um, so that you know exactly, okay, this is a reasonable place to start looking. Um, and, and, and what is the sample set we're gonna be looking at in order to make sure we capture all the potential problems here. Um, so those are just, a few of the different ways that, that you can use it. Um, I'm sure our colleagues from Deloitte can, can go into a lot more depth in that uh, with the time permitting. I don't know, maybe maybe not. Uh, but, uh, but to answer your question, Jimmy, yes, of course, DOJ expects companies to be using data in their internal investigations. And I know I'm going to ask our friends at Deloitte, you know, the loaded question, though, because only because we are now, I think most internal investigations are, we're inundated with communications. You know, it used to be, well, you pulled the emails and we thought that was a lot of information. Now we pull the cell phones, we pull the Zoom chats, you know, people talking on this Zoom, you know, your Microsoft Teams, what have you, I guess. What is, you know, what, what can companies do and how can they use data, data analytics, you know, to make those reviews smarter and more efficient? Understanding we have a minute, so no pressure, guys. Um, I, I mean, I'll start, I'll give my, my 30 second. I think there's nothing special, right, to do, you know, regarding um, the e-communications. You really have to apply the same tact uh, in terms of, you know, how can you access the data? How can you monitor it? What's the cadence for monitoring? 
Uh, it really depends on the risks. You know, if you're a financial organization and you're subject to like 17A4 uh, communications and you want to make sure that you're monitoring for risks, insider trading or securities, um, you know, violations, then it's going to be important that you design your monitoring to account for those risks. Um, if you're not and you're trying to detect unexpected events, then you should scale the analysis and collection of that data, you know, appropriately. The tools are out there, they're more efficient. So um, it definitely, you know, gives you a leg up to accomplish, you know, what you couldn't have done easily in five or 10 years ago. And with that, I think we're right at our time. Uh, the CLE code, the second CLE code is up on the screen. So make sure you recorded that. But on behalf of the panel, uh, would really like to thank everybody for joining us here today. Um, hopefully you've drawn some value uh, from what we've talked about, some really interesting cutting edge things. And uh, hopefully, you know, the next presentation, we can all be in person uh, and, and do this again. So thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.